Keeping the public in public art this week as museum prices rise and developers use galleries to push neighborhoods to the brink, we hear from a panel of artists, activists, and curators about what cities and communities can do to keep culture accessible to those who produce it. And we visit with Brooklyn's educated little monsters and hear why they won't quit. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Money for the arts. Where does it come from and where does it go to? Every day there is another multi-million dollar art auction someplace. Art as a private commodity is the preserve of the very rich. But what about the rest of us? In New York City, the Metropolitan Museum, where entry had been on a contribution basis, recently instituted a hefty ticket price for non-New Yorkers. Then there's public art. Starting in the 1930s, the U.S. Treasury requires 1% of the cost of federal buildings to be applied to art and what they called that decoration. In 1959, Philadelphia became the first U.S. city to do the same thing. Now more than half of the states maintain percent for the art programs. In New York, the Percent for the Art programs commissioned hundreds of site-specific projects by artists whose work they believe reflects the city's diversity. Alison Tsar's statue of Harriet Tubman striding through Harlem is one good example. But who decides where that 1% goes? How is it calculated? And if we all agree that arts and creativity are important ingredients of life, including city life, are we doing everything we can to support not just art, but also artists, including the ones that live in our midst? I'm joined today by three guests who make it their job to figure out how we democratize access to art and art making. First, Betty Yu. She's an artist and organizer of the Chinatown Art Brigade. Amin Hussein is co-founder of the MTL Collective and professor at NYU. And last but not least, Charlotte Cohen. She's executive director of the Brooklyn Arts Council, and she once directed New York's 1% program. Welcome all. So glad to have you. Um, gosh, I don't know where to start. There's so many places we could begin, but let's just start with the public part of art. We, we know about the auctions. We know about those ticket prices at the museums. We're here really to talk about the public piece, which is kind of the third leg of the stool, I, I think. Um, in your view, Charlotte, what is, what is public art and why do we need it? We can talk about public art objects. <laughs> that's one place to start. And that's what the Percent for Art programs that you just mentioned, Laura, a fund. And that's a funding that comes from capital budgets for construction in the city. And there's 1% of the budget allocated to artists to create permanent works. That's one kind of public art. There's temporary public art that happens um, by individual artists in many different places and by city agencies, private companies, you name it. And then there's the work that uh, Brooklyn Arts Council does, which is in funding individual artists, collectives, and not very small nonprofit organizations with grant money that is uh, mostly from public sources like the city and state. And those are um, in the amounts of $2,000 to $5,000. And they often make or break an artist project. And that money is really designated for the public part of that work. So it's not to buy the paint or the um, studio rent. It's really to bring that artwork out mm. to the public realm. And that's looking another at kind. Some of the public art that people will see if they've been in the New York streets in the last few mm. years. Um, it's always remarkable when you realize your environment is so influenced by some of this kind of work. Uh, but as you're saying, it's a complicated array of things that public art and public art funding is about. Why do we do it? Betty, why is it important to you? Um, you know, for Chinatown Art Brigade, I think public art um, is uh, an incredible um, opportunity to really uh, reflect on what's happening in certain communities, right? Um, and I think for Chinatown Art Brigade, um, we, when we first launched, we actually launched because CAV, Organizing Asian Communities, had a 
an organization that they started called Chinatown Tenants Union. After 9-11, there was a lot of massive displacement in Chinatown. And they've been doing lots of organizing to prevent eviction. Um, and they realized that they were really strong on their organizing strategies and direct action, but they really wanted to incorporate art and culture. And they wanted to do these outdoor projections at night. And we collaborated with the Illuminator that came out of um, mm -hmm. uh, Occupy Wall Street. And we started to project these messages. And I think that's true, a tr true people's public um, public art. What were because, the messages? Uh, the messages were, um, tenants were very clear about the three target audiences. One was reaching other immigrant tenants to get involved with the anti-eviction organizing because, uh, you know, massive amounts of, of people are being displaced. I mean, we've lost already 30,000 units of affordable housing in Chinatown and Lower East Side alone since 9-11, and 30% of the Asian population has declined. So it's, you know, a really dire situation. And so they wanted to use this as an opportunity to project messages to organize other immigrant tenants. So we had messages like uh, tenants unite, get organized. Uh, do you know your rights? Do you know landlord harassment is illegal? Just th different things like that in Chinese and in English and even Spanish because the Lower East Side is right there. And then they also wanted to reach policymakers. And the third audience I want to say that they definitely wanted to reach was they were really clear um, the role that artists um, and galleries have been playing in Chinatown. Mm. Um, and they have been playing the role of, of, of the gentrifiers and the real estate developers know that they uh, need to bring these galleries and these artists in to raise the real estate level, right? And what, what we talk about as the Trojan horse, right? So these real estate developers have gotten so, so sophisticated in using artists, maybe artists that look like me in Chinatown, for instance, uh, come in with the galleries, 130 galleries that used to be mom and pop places and bakeries. They come in, they raise the real estate value in about eight to 10 years, and then, and then they're big box stores, right? Mm. And then even those galleries can't afford it anymore. And so how do we kind of prevent artists being pit against one another, especially working class, low income artists like myself, who's trying to survive and doing the work that we do. But I do think when we talk about public art, we have to talk about um, accountability and public art for who and for what. And if it's in a community, it must not, it cannot be used to displace people, you know? And you often see public art projects, um, especially through the creative placemaking um, uh, approaches where you have real estate developers uh, collaborating with certain stakeholders of a right. community um, and they use it, and then what ends up happening, they, they say, oh, we're here to beautify a blighted community, right? right? And those are code words, and we often know what that, that leads to. Right, so we have already many things on the table oh. here, from public funding of public art to how artists and art is sometimes used to kind of, somebody called it art washing, um, development that might displace artists. Uh, and, and you're also getting to some of these questions of, well, who and which artists and who gets to decide? That's part of your project, mm -hmm. is to kind of democratize some of this decision making. Uh, talk about that a little bit and some of your visions of how this is well, happening now, but could be doing happening. I mean, one of the things that I think uh, with Chinatown Art Brigade, where we collaborated as part of Decolonize This Place, for three months we were in Tribeca, we got offered an exhibition as Decolonize This Place, and we said we'd take up the space, we'd make it a movement space, a commons, we would incorporate art and culture and these communities that are participating as a way to kind of take a stand and have a conversation amongst us as artists, cultural producers in the city, recognizing that we are complicit in the gentrifying and displacement and dispossession and transfer of wealth that's happening in that process and the instrumentalization of art and artists in the process. And how can we take a stand both to stop that from happening and engage in a political process, not with the state, but with each other, mm. right? And I think that that's an important part and part of the conversation that we're trying to have. We can create our own spaces, but we have to build power in the process and we have to recognize our complicity. So there is a, it's very difficult to live in New York City at all, but it's, it's impossible to live and not be a gentrifier, recognizing that we're already on stolen land. And so when we talk about this city belonging to us, I think one of the things that we try to say is let's, let's look around. We have a Columbus statue that's public art that's barricaded. Monuments in this city for whom, right? Public art for any purpose, mm -hmm. especially in a time when we're actually bordering on ice in our communities, taking immigrants from their homes, people being deported. What's the point right now Simultaneously, we're being pitted against each other as artists, and art is being art washed and art washing. And we're wondering, why, what can we do 
when we know that the city is leaving us behind. And we've said this to Tom Finkelpearl. It's not that I want money. It's not why a collective wants money. But it's just like this idea of no advocacy and dialogue for the sake of dialogue and public art that beautifies, knowing that developers' private public partnerships are happening, are not going to create a better situation. All right. So insofar as we talk about systems on this program, let's talk oh. about some of the systems that you're, you've been involved in and you've all been observing and getting engaged with. Tom Finkelpearl, de, de Blasio is appointed director of culture, the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, the mayor here in New York City, this program is watched by people all over, uh, is a progressive mayor who came in with a cultural agenda, which was kind of exciting in and of itself. Create New York, in, brought in some new money, right? $18 mm -hmm. million, dollars, something like mm -hmm. that. Had a plan, mm -hmm. also got a lot of grief. Mm -hmm. um, so let's just talk about a specific plan with a view to, this is an example for people all around the country. Mm -hmm. The mayor meant well, right? Charlotte, tell us a little bit about what you understand to have been the agenda, be the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and then I want to hear some of the critique and, and where this could go. There has been a lot of critique of the plan. Um, and rightfully so. The plan is very aspirational, as most uh, stri strategic plans are. And so it lays out a whole series of um, potential ways to support individual artists, um, artists' communities in different forms, collectives, and neighborhoods. And part of that plan is about really providing access to the arts and culture in a way that probably hasn't had a light sh shown on it. Um, shined on it in um, other administrations. There certainly wasn't the kind of focus on individual artists that there has been. The um, five arts councils, one in each borough of New York City, received more funding this year to re-grant to individual artists. Very specifically, that was a directive from the Department of Cultural Affairs. So that was one way to try to get a flow of money out to individual artists. Um, the city just appointed a nightlife mayor, which was a way, is a way to really take very seriously the challenges of DIY spaces um, that pertain to arts and culture and how they can remain in their spaces without being uh, succumbed to the kinds of uh, raids by the fire department, the Department of Buildings that have when you say really DIY spaces, these are sometimes squatted buildings or buildings that have no, been... No, they're typically um, artists, collectives, or probably not, possibly nonprofits, 501c3s, or even individual artists who have um, leases, but those leases are jeopardized by the incredible cost of running those spaces. Sometimes they have to sell liquor at shows that they would prefer to be all ages. Mm -hmm. um, so that counts people out mm -hmm. who would otherwise have access to that work, that important work that's going on. This has been really a, a very important case in Bushwick, for example, the Brooklyn neighborhood, and many other neighborhoods across the city where artists have been really challenged um, in regard to maintaining real estate, which is the, the yeah. uh, biggest challenge of all in New York City, as we all know. Let's take a look at a video about a project in Bushwick itself. Uh, it's part of a program that was called The Silent Barn. It's been around for five years, and this program is particularly a program for kids and by kids of color in the neighborhood, Educated Little Monsters. Let's take a look. It speaks to some of those challenges, and then we'll come back and discuss it. It's basically to empower kids in their communities, black and brown youth that are being displaced um, through gentrification, white influx, and showing them ways to reclaim their community through music and art in ways that people typically wouldn't listen. I run Educated Little Monsters. It's a full performing visual arts program. We have musical theater, live band instruments, hip hop, dance. Every single time a space, like a venue or a gallery or a coffee shop opens up, you're actively seeing people be pushed out. Safe spaces is the most important thing that we can give the youth, especially youth of color, who are no longer identifying with the changes in their community. She basically just like takes over this whole space 
with all these kids and they just hang out and have a lot of space to do whatever they want. It's the kind of program that I think that I would have really benefited from having as a kid. Jazz, the person that founded the group, she lived up the block from me and I was friends with her son. So we, we always used to just play on the block and stuff. And then it started off as like a poetry group. And I came because I, I wrote and I like poetry, but like I slowly like, was like, we should put a beat on it. Like, put some music to it. It's not like the average like adult like trying to put a limitation on a child. Like, she saw the potential. Like she always says now, like we have superpowers. Any talent anybody has is like a power. Like you, you're using it to create something. So she's like, she saw that and was like, all right, y'all choose what y'all want to do. I'm just here to be the platform to get y'all to give visibility to like the community and stuff. It was my first taste of really being outside of my own element. I started rapping basically just putting videos up on YouTube and on my Instagram. So this was like the first time I was around other people and other people were actually like hearing what I had to say. It was a little awkward because that like I've never freestyled before then. So when I went over there and I was freestyling with other people, like I was messing up a lot, but everybody over there it was like a real community vibe and like they encouraged me to keep going and um get better. From day one, like they've been there for me. It was like at a time where I really didn't have anybody on my side, like they were always there. And it's like, it's been more than just a hip hop program. It's been more than just a music program. It's like, it's been like a family for me. You just bring your talent and people just help you out with your talent. They don't tell you how to write. They don't tell you how to act. They don't tell you how to dance, how to sing. It's you just come and be yourself. I've been through a lot. Um, me growing up when I was younger, my dad was abusive. My parents, uh, they didn't accept me for being gay. So they kicked me and my girlfriend out and we was homeless for like two years. It just gives me life. I love seeing people that I know. I love creating with other people. I just love making music in general. And I feel like this space gives me that platform. I've seen them be able to stand up and speak about things that they haven't been able to in the past because they were taught that they're not allowed to. I've seen them sit together and resolve issues in ways that we're taught we're not supposed to do. I've seen them protect each other. I've just seen so much resilience and so much leadership. I don't feel like I'm creating a culture. I feel like I'm preserving what hip hop was always supposed to be, which was a voice for the oppressed and people of color. Thanks to the good people at Educated Little Monsters and the Silent Barn for that video. It, it gets to a lot, right, of what these institutions do. Um, I mean, what's your vision of how we move forward in a better way? I mean, you, you're going to have critiques, I, I'm sure, of, of the de Blasio program. Um, I'd like to hear some, but I really do want us to move to how do we do this better? Mm. This can't just be a city of high price art auctions and high ticket museums and then everybody else living as well as they can, stepping on each other's necks. I mean, they're, they're, you know, I mean, in a way, it's, we need to reorient towards each other. I think that the idea of galleries and the idea of people moving in as gentrifiers is a reality that we're living in. It's not about trying to create sides and, and, and demonize and not be productive. But when you have situations like Chinatown Art Brigade, they went to galleries and told them, here's how you can be part of the community, right. right? There's ways in which the voices are not being recognized. And that in a situation where you have a gallery in a place, it can be a space like that. There are many spaces that exist. Part of what we need to recognize is we need to go from an economy of scarcity to one of abundance. There are many homeless people and they're increasing in the city, but there are many vacant lots. There are many vacant lots that we can take over with the support of the city based on culture and art in a situation that we recognize. The, the issue with art is that it creates spaces for people to care for one another at a time when we're not allowed to. Mm. And you saw this during Occupy. The previous administration moved any, everyone out of a park based on sanitation reasons, when it was actually an issue of dissent in relation to the conditions, our economic conditions. So how can people in the city think with us to actually look at the city and recognize, not based on capital, but actually usages that could happen that can produce more opportunities for these kind of 
uh, activity. And are there pressures that we can put not just on our public budgets, because these 1% funds come from publicly funded buildings, but on private developers and pi private um, industry too? Mm -hmm. Betty? Yeah, I mean, that's one thing um, I have to say that, um, you know, in Chinatown, we're in the front lines of sort of ground zero in many ways of art washing. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, in terms of these private galleries, right, and um, the insidious nature of how developers are using these galleries, I think that it's been interesting because we have at Artist Space decolonized this place, organized a, a town hall meeting where a lot of galleries came out and they didn't want to be the ones to be picked on, but we said, it's not about you as an individual, it's about the system of gentrification. We understand that you're a part of it, you're complicit, but you're obviously the little cog in the machine. And so how do we you know, figure this out together and giving them an opportunity uh, to figure out how do you not be the a-hole in the community that um, you know, only sees Chinatown as a cheap food and cheap rent um, and, and a place to sell your $10,000 paintings, but as you're a, that you're a part of the community. And I have to say for the cultural plan, really quickly, which is, you know, if you want to create equity within art, right, in the city, you can't do that without addressing the fundamental issues that working people are facing, right? Gentrification, police violence, economic instability. And so I think that what we're seeing in our communities, uh, I grew up in Sunset Park, I'm from New York City, born and raised, is that there's an increase of police violence of people who are actually from the neighborhood, who've been living in the neighborhood, and they're there to protect yeah. the newcomers in Industry City, for instance, right? So we need to address all these issues. And I think that the art equity piece um, needs to be folded into that. And like Amin said, I do think that in Chinatown, a lot, you know, we've heard people say, well, there's not a lot of culture here, right? So these art galleries are bringing culture here. But informal spaces, right? Tons of places like restaurants and uh, centers and, and, and sure. places that are cultural, vibrant places of um, of, uh, yeah. of places that um, where people come together at, and at a very big, I mean the culture it'd be hard to miss culture in Chinatown honestly mm -hmm. I, I don't that's much bigger conversation in mm -hmm. every neighborhood that we're talking mm -hmm. about we could have the same conversation yeah. about yeah. is it bringing in creatives on the Richard Florida kind of model right. or talking about who is actually there and I think we are talking about who is actually there the role of art though the role of arts organizations it is striking that in the very year that we had the Ai Weiwei exhibition talking about fences make good neighbors and talking about immigration and the wonders of immigrants who make art. We saw a lot of immigrant New Yorkers edged out because of gentrification. And then we saw an initiative at Queens Museum where Laura Racevich mm -hmm. even just raised the question of the museum being a sanctuary mm -hmm. space. She lost her job, mm -hmm. looks like, at least she's mm -hmm. no longer there. Has it ever worked well? I mean, is there an example where a city program has really worked, Charlotte, in your, in your view? On both the uh, displacement mm -hmm. and the, the art creation side. Oh, that's a really big, big question. And city programs, you know, really tend often to address uh, very focused areas, for instance, arts education. So the uh, city council's after school program that is funded in the millions of dollars, I would say, that really goes into public schools and funds. Uh, arts and education programming after school, the um, SUCASA pro program that funds creative aging programs all over the city mm -hmm. and with many, many different disciplines and artists. I think arts education is a kind of a, a very grounding place to start in terms of then building up to communities that can be more vibrant and aware of the arts that exist right in their own neighborhoods, Some right? People talk about the CETA funding program in the 70s, mm -hmm. which was grants to artists. Mm -hmm. If you could do one thing, you've got 10 seconds, one thing, what would it be? It would be for the galleries to open up their spaces mm -hmm. for the communities in their neighborhoods to actually organize, make art, be that space. All right, that space needs help. You've had a lot of ideas raised on this show. I want to encourage you to tell, talk to us about what you think could be done. If you had that 10 seconds, what would you say? Betty, Charlotte, I mean, thank you so much for being with us. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show. More information at our website.
Thanks for watching The Laura Flanders Show. If you want to receive weekly commentary from me or find out early what we've got coming up, sign up to become a monthly member on our Patreon site and receive exclusive access to member-only content, including extra interviews, podcasts, and more good stuff. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media and feel free to write to me and tell me what you think. That's Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.org. And thanks for watching. Stay kind, stay curious. Till next time, I'm Laura Flanders.